Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jay Jasnoff. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, 12th annual Joshua and Verona Watmo Lecture in Linguistics. Uh, as many of you know, the Watmo Lectures were established by a gift of the Watmo family, uh, and especially of the late Mrs. Verona Taylor Watmo. The history of the Harvard Linguistics Department uh, will forever be linked to the name of Professor Joshua Watmo, who arrived in Cambridge, Massachusetts from the UK in 1926 and retired as Harvard's first professor of linguistics in 1963. In between, he had been professor of the classics and then professor of comparative philology, uh, the name by which linguistics was known before taking on its current name, linguistics, in 1951. Uh, the progression from classics to linguistics was reflected in Watmo's work, he began as a specialist in Latin, Italic, and Gaulish inscriptions, but gradually shifted over the course of his career to language more generally. He was especially intrigued by the use of information theory and other mathematical tools as an aid to this study, and the focus of his later work is reflected in his 1955 book, Language, a Modern Synthesis. Watmo's retirement uh, was followed by his premature death in 1964. He was survived by his wife, Verona, through whose generosity uh, these lectures were established, and by their children, Jeremy Watmo and the late Theodora Watmo Green, um, by their grandchildren as well. Jeremy Watmo was unable to be with us today, but it's a pleasure, as always, to see Fred Green, the uh, original Watmo couple's son-in-law, uh, and his three children, Alan Green, Phil Green, and Carol Green Nason, all sitting there, and we're very happy to see them, as we so often do. Uh, we're now going to move to the more academically focused part of the day's proceedings. Before we do, let me just remind you that after the lecture and question period here in Fong Auditorium, there'll be a reception on the second floor of the Harvard Faculty Club, a uh, six or seven minute walk away. All, everybody here is welcome to come to that. Now it's time for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Philippe Schlenker, for which purpose I'm going to call on my colleague, Professor Gennaro Kierke. So, uh, one does need notes in presenting Philippe. Uh, so he's director of the research at the Institut Janico, and for no less than 11 weeks, a global distinguished professor at NYU. He got his PhD in linguistics in 1999 here at MIT. Uh, I mean, believe that Irene was uh, his supervisor. In 2002, he also got a PhD in philosophy this time at the Ecole des Hautes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He taught for several years at UCLA before going uh, back to Paris around 2007 with several back and forth. Philippe has made important influential contribution to many areas of linguistics, often revitalizing debates that were stagnant for a while with the discovery of new generalizations and the reviving of new important ideas. Um, I can only mention some broad themes in his research. A large area that he made important contributions to is the area of indexicals and exact indexical shift with considerable fieldwork in languages like Ewe or Amharic, all the way to American Sign Language, where he has also pursued this topic. The semantics of various facets of binding, from what has come to be known as donkey anaphora to sequence tense phenomena to modalities. 
One of the areas that is explored more thoroughly is the area of presuppositions and presupposition theory. Now, even if he had done just that, we would have invited him today to speak. But while he was doing all of this, he sort of extended uh, his area of interest to sort of areas that are at the borderline of linguistics as, you know, as narrow disciplines. And in particular, he um, has started a very interesting research program in sign languages that is going to report on today. He's worked on monkey semantics. That's his chosen words. They were not there to characterize it as such. But, uh, you know, uh, exploring what can be learned uh, about our cognitive capacity through intra-species comparisons. And, last but not least, the semantics of music that he thinks functions very differently from the semantics of natural language. And when we invited him, we wouldn't know what to hope for, <laughs> which of these exciting areas uh, he might uh, tell us about. Um, so, I mean, incidentally, yes, I, just to uh, add a uh, trait, uh, Philip is a fluent speaker of, near, by fluent I mean native or near native, speaker of French, English, German, Russian, and much to my surprise, Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Very fluent, he can lecture in Italian. So the unusual extension of his knowledge, his insight, into so many aspects of the human mind and his boundless energy, what do they remind you of? Well, let's say the great humanist of the Italian Renaissance. <laughs> For his math angle, one might be tempted to compare him to Leonardo. But I don't know how Philippe's drawing is, <laughs> and I didn't dare to ask. <laughs> Certainly, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, the author of the Oration on the Dignity of Man, which is the humanist manifesto, and that actually called upon him uh, the wrath of Pope Innocent VIII, who condemned him as heresiac, his positions. And um, not because of my, if, if that was his destiny today, uh, I would try to intercede with the current Pope not out of any authority, just for national contiguity. <laughs> so please welcome Philippe Schenker. Thank you very much, Gennaro, for this uh, overly kind introduction. Some of the details in particular about uh, languages might not be entirely accurate, but I appreciate it. The, the claims nonetheless. Um, I, I would like to start by thanking Harvard University and the Watmo and Green family for this invitation. My first academic year my first academic year in the United States was as an Archer Sachs Fellow um, and I have fond memories of that period and of numerous later exchanges with Harvard. So it's a real pleasure 
and a true honor to be here, and also to have in the assistance some um, friends from MIT and my uh, former dissertation advisor, Irena Heim. Let me also thank the European Research Council and my si sign language consultants without whom this work would not have been possible, Ludovic Ducasse for a French sign language at LSF and John Lamberton for ASL. John is also a co-author on a 2013 paper, which will be mentioned a little bit later. Thanks also to the ASL interpreters who are making this lecture accessible. So my topic today is semantics, the study of meaning. I will argue that sign languages have a crucial role to play in the study for two reasons. Sometimes they make explicit and visible the logical form of sentences, which may be hard to tease apart in spoken languages. And sometimes they have richer expressive mechanisms which only exist in limited form in spoken language. Now, in morphosyntax, it's relatively uncontroversial that if you wish to study case, nominative, accusative, genitive, etc., English or French might not be the best places to start. Sure, there are remnants of case in English and French, but it can be studied in a more interesting fashion in languages such as Russian and many others, which have a richer case system. I will argue that the same conclusion holds of iconic enrichments in sign language, and specifically of iconic modulations. So here are the claims I will be making. Some are traditional, some are more recent, and some are new. A standard claim is that sign languages, or sign, I will often, as, as I will often say, are part of the same linguistic system <coughs> as spoken languages or speech. The second claim, a relatively standard one, but a more recent one, is that in some cases, sign makes visible some aspects of the logical forms of sentences which are covert in speech. The third claim is that sign also has iconic resources that are mostly absent in speech. So at this point of the argument, we'll have the conclusion that in sign language and in spoken language, you have the same underlying logical system, that this logical system is sometimes more explicit in sign language, but in addition, that there are certain thematic resources which are present in sign language but not very much in spoken language. At this point of the comparison, people usually object that the comparison is unfair, that spoken language has rich iconic means but by way of gestures. And really one should compare sign language with iconicity, not to speech alone, but to speech with gestures. I will grant this point, but I will claim that even when gestures are taken into account, speech does not fully match sign because a certain class of meanings, iconic modulations, have greater semantic possibilities in sign language than in gestures. That's the plan. A little bit of background about sign language, or rather sign languages. <coughs> there are as many different sign languages in principle as there are sociologically, sociolinguistically coherent group of deaf people. Here I have displayed a picture of the first deaf member of the European Parliament, Adam Kosha. He expresses himself in Hungarian sign language and you see behind him an interpreter interpreting into international sign language, 
which happens to be a kind of Esperanto, except that it works fairly well in sign language. It's used often in international conferences, more so than Esperanto is in scientific conferences for spoken languages. Now, the first observation which has become traditional in linguistics is that sign languages are part of the same linguistic system as spoken languages. From a linguistic perspective, there has been a lot of work showing that this conclusion is correct. So sign language and spoken languages have the same general grammatical properties. And in addition, sign languages have certain similarities with each other that they don't necessarily share with spoken languages. But linguistic typology has, of course, to include the typology of sign languages. One can also start from neuroimaging and lesion studies. A conclusion uh, um, was stated as follows by McSweeney and colleagues in 2008. Overwhelmingly, lesion and neuroimaging studies indicate that the neural systems supporting signed and spoken languages are very similar. And by way of example, here is from the same survey a comparison between the brain areas that get specifically activated by language in the brain of a deaf native sign of British sign language on the left and um, areas that are specifically activated by English in the brain of a hearing English native speaker. And what's particularly striking is that if you compare the left hemisphere of the deaf signer and the left hemisphere of the hearing signer, despite the complete difference in modality, the same general areas get activated specifically by British Sign Language and by English. These are the two classic areas of language, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. The second point I want to make is that in some cases, sign makes visible some aspects of the logical form of senses that are covert in speech. So I will start with a very simple example. Look at the sentence in A in English. Sarkozy told Obama that he would win the election. There is an ambiguity. He could refer to Sarkozy or he could refer to Obama. Most syntacticians and semanticists make the claim, a controversial one, that the ambiguity is represented by different logical forms in the minds of the speakers. The claim is that one reading is represented by giving the same abstract symbol, which is not pronounced, on Sarkozy and he. Here, this abstract symbol is an index one. Sarkozy carries the index one, Obama carries the index two, and if you want the pronoun to refer to Sarkozy, one way to do it would be for he to carry the same index as Sarkozy one, and similarly for Obama. This can be actually made much clearer in more sophisticated examples, but I will stick to the simplest examples here. So this was the claim, that there are these abstract elements which are not pronounced and yet play a crucial role in how we understand these sentences. When people started studying sign language from a formal perspective, they realized that something very close to these indices are realized in signing space by way of positions in signing space. Positions in signing space 
correspond to different discourse reference, different formal indices. So I'll give you an example that will make this clear. This particular example is from Frankenstein language, LSF, but it could be replicated in um, other sign languages. So I'll give you a little bit of vocabulary before I show you the video. So uh, the sign name for Sarkozy in French sign language is this, because of the years. <laughs> Obama is this. So this is the O of the manual alphabet. This is the B of the manual alphabet, and this is the proper name for Obama. Then, and that will be the crucial part, there will be a position on the left for Sarkozy. It will be represented super explicitly. That's not necessary, but the example is vivid because of this. There will be a finger corresponding to the person Sarkozy and a finger for the person Obama. These will be our overt representations of these. Then there will be a verb, tell. So this is I tell you. This is the position for I. This is the position for you. And I tell you is a position from the subject to the object, if you will. But of course, if the subject is Sarkozy and the object is Obama, this will be the realization of the verb. These are called agreement verbs in sign language. Then there will be a pointing sign that realizes the pronoun. Pointing could be towards Sarkozy, or it could be towards Obama. Then there will be will in French sign language, win the election. And now I want to show you a real sentence from French sign language. But because French sign language in this case disambiguates between the two readings of the English sentence, the sentence will come in two varieties which will be signed one after the other. Sarkozy, Obama, he tells him that he will win the election. Sarkozy, Obama, he tells him that he will win the election. Okay? So what I wanted you to see is that you have these two positions, Sarkozy on the left, Obama on the right. And depending on whether you say he will win the election or he will win the election, you get different. So there you have it. Sarkozy introduced a position in signing space on the left. That corresponds to the index one that we had before. Obama introduced a position on the right. That corresponded to the index two that we had in here. And depending on whether you point towards the position that corresponds to the index one or to the position that uh, corresponds to the index two, you get one of the two readings that you had in the English sentence. And of course, for a syntactician or a semanticist, this is very interesting because it suggests that these abstract objects, indices that we claimed exist in the minds of the speakers, despite the fact that you don't pronounce them in English, have a mental reality that you can see in sign language. Now, pronouns turn out to be uh, very important for a number of issues in uh, linguistics and philosophy, they play a crucial role in the expressive power of language. Why? Because they make it possible to express logical dependencies. Here I have given you an example. It's the uh, bold-faced sentence that you have on the screen. Every politician knows someone who will betray him. There is a formal dependency between every politician and him. If you were to translate this complicated sentence in a logical system, there would be a universal quantifier which introduces a certain variable x1 and the same variable x1 in that position. Okay? So that's the reason there has been so much interest in pronouns 
in language because they are the closest counterpart of variables in logical systems, and therefore they play a crucial role in the logical power of language. There are other uh, reasons as well. The philosopher Klein at Harvard University claimed a long time ago to be is to be the value of a variable by which he meant to be is to be the value of the variable bound by an existential quantifier. This was a test for what a language or theory is committed to, the kinds of objects that exist according to this language theory. Okay, so these are some motivations for being very interested in pronouns. Now, what we've seen is that um, Pronouns in sign language, realized by way of pointing in various positions of signing space, are arguably the overt realization of variables which are covert in spoken language. You might say, well, how do we know that these are not two entirely different systems? Well, we can know that these are not entirely different systems because we can look at a number of formal properties of pronouns in spoken language and see that pronouns in sign language have related properties. I already discussed the distinction between first person denoting pronouns, second person denoting pronouns. And when you have third person deno denoting pronouns, there could be a variety of positions for them. Um, you can, in fact, discuss cases, we'll see this in a second, of ellipsis. If you say something like, Peter loves his wife, John does too. That has two reasons. One is John loves Peter's wife. Another one is John loves John's wife. Okay. And uh, you might think that in sign language, because it seems to be so explicit, you only have one reading. But that is not the case. In exactly these environments, you will get exactly the same kind of energy. Yet another property. In English, there is a distinction between reflexive and non-reflexive pronouns. If you say John likes him, this could not mean that John likes himself. Okay, so there is a certain requirement that here the object pronoun should not refer to the same thing as the subject. Himself has the opposite requirement. There are related distinctions within American sign language and French sign language. And there are more intricate formal constraints, which I do not get into here for the sake of time. But the structure of the argument is you can look at abstract formal constraints and ensure that, in fact, pronouns in sign language, despite their difference in realization from of pronouns in spoken language, are part of the same thing. Now, at this point, we have the conclusion that um, sign language seems to have, at least in some corners, but the, the point generalizes, the same kind of logic as spoken language, but sometimes it makes it more explicit. Now, uh, I will make a different point, that sign also has iconic resources that are mostly absent in speech. In other words, it has the same logic, but greater iconic resources. So now I, I want I want to provide a very simple example. Um, I have talked so far about positions in signing space which are on a horizontal place, horizontal plane. So these positions are called locus in the singular, loci in the plural. But now the important thing is, if you're talking about someone uh, who is tall or powerful or important, you can point upwards. Okay? So I want to show you an example of how this is uh, realized. This will be now an example from, an, from American Sign Language. Okay. I will uh, give you three different versions 
are the same sentence. The only difference will be whether um, the final pronoun is pointing high in an in intermediate position or low. Okay. Uh, the important thing to know is just that the proper name here is R. It could be Robert, for instance, Robert with a beard. This is the R of the manual alphabet. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that this is a body anchored proper name, which because it is anchored to the body, does not in self introduce a locus. We use this because we wanted to see what was the effect of the pronoun. We were not interested in seeing what was the effect of the proper name. Okay. So these are two versions of the same sentence. So, yesterday I see R, I not understand him. Yesterday I see R, I not understand him. Yesterday I see R, I not understand him. Okay. Now, if you give these examples out of the blue, um, only the neutral one will be considered to be acceptable. If you have not explained why you would be pointing upwards or downwards, this will be a weird thing. But if you ask your consultant to think of a context in which this would be good, they will come up with this inference that R is somebody that has to be tall, powerful, or important to license the high pointing. Okay. Um, now, the important thing is that, uh, as we will see later, this inference is in fact iconic. Um, it is iconic because, as we will see in a second, if you're talking about a tall person who is hanging upside down as opposed to standing up, high pointing will become low pointing. Nonetheless, this property of um, high pointing resembles, in crucial ways, a property of gender features in English. In fact, it resembles gender features in two respects. But I say pointing at someone in the distance. Uh, you know, I did, not, I did not understand her. What you're denying is that there was understanding. What you're not denying is that the denotation of the pronoun is female. Okay. So in other words, this is what linguists call a presupposition the opposite of the at issue component of the sentence. And the example I gave was exactly of the sort I had in sign language. I not understand him, but you still preserve the inference that the person was tall or powerful or important. Okay? And the next thing right, is that these high specifications resemble gender features in another respect. They seem to be, in a way, very grammatical in another respect, namely how they interact with the lips. So here, I need to start from a very simple English example. English example. If you say, Mary likes herself, John doesn't. There is a missing uh, verb, verb phrase, in this case. And linguists have assumed that in some way <laughs> you get the missing verb phrase by copying from the antecedent sentence where it is. But if you do this, something weird happens. If you say, Mary likes herself, John doesn't like herself, you should get a reading which is completely weird, and certainly which is not the salient reading, or certainly a possible reading, which is, Mary likes herself, John doesn't like himself. So it seems that <coughs> so, so it seems that in the process of ellipsis resolution, certain grammatical elements can be disregarded. Somehow the process that copies the missing verb phrase, which is in the box in the screen, is allowed to erase the gender features. Okay? It's because it's allowed to erase the gender features that you get a meaning for John doesn't which is John doesn't like himself. Okay. 
So it's the only thing that we'll need to remember at this point, that ellipsis has this ability to disregard certain grammatical elements. And now I will display an example from French Sign Language. There are similar ones from American Sign Language, which um, pertains to a giant and a short person um, who are training to be astronauts. So they will be in all sorts of weird positions. But the target sentence will be this. I, I will show the LFS sentence in a second. So the crucial thing will be there will be a position for the, sh for the tall person, for the giant here. There will be a position for the short person. And the example is constructed in such a way that at some point our target example will be the part in blue. He, okay, now this is high pointing. Why is this high pointing? This is high pointing because I'm talking about a, a tall person. Okay. So he lights, and then there will be himself with high pointing as well. At this point, you should see a similarity between this case and the case in blue on the bottom of the screen, where you have herself with feminine features. Here you have himself with high features, if you will. That's the, the, the point of similarity. So you'll have he liked himself. But then you continue, he, okay, and now this will refer to the short person. And if you try to say he, pointing upwards, this will be weird, because I'm talking about a short person, I'm not talking about a short I say he, and then I continue not. Okay. So now there is also a verb phrase missing, just like the box part was a missing verb phrase, on the bottom row. The box part is a missing verb phrase in the top example as well. And so you could think that we're going to reconstruct, you could think that we're going to copy, so he, like himself. No. But that would be weird, because this is, I'm now talking about a short person. The sentence is in fact fine. And the fact that the sense is fine suggests that we can disregard the high feature specifications of the first reflexive pronoun in exactly the same way as we disregarded the gender specification of herself and the bottom of the Okay? So, I'm now going to play the example. Okay, and so there will be different versions of this. So, big, tall person, short person, the two of them, the two train, the two of them are like this. He likes himself, he not. Neutral, neutral. He likes himself, he not. That's the crucial one. He likes himself, he not. Okay? The crucial condition was the second one, where you had he likes himself, he not. And the crucial point was that we somehow disregarded the height, height specifications of the reflexive pronoun that we had uh, in exactly the same way as we did for gender features. Now, I want to go a little bit uh, Further, with two common beliefs. The first belief is that morphosyntactically gest gestures differ from signs and words in not having a grammar. The second belief is that semantically, gestures make it possible to match within spoken language the iconic effects found in sign language. So I will suggest that both beliefs are actually incorrect, that there is more structure than meets the eye in gestures, but that despite this, gestural enrichments do not yield the same effects as sign language iconic enrichments. There are systematic differences between them. So I will introduce uh, some terminology at this point. 
uh, with apologies for some examples that involve violent and objectionable actions, but that's the state of the literature. Um, okay? You take, take the discussions to be metaphorical in what follows. Okay, so if I say, you know, your brother I will punish, you get a different, slightly different meaning from your brother I will punish. When you say your brother I will punish, you understand that it's some kind of physical punishment, which you didn't have in the initial, in the initial um, sentence. That's a co-speech gesture. It co-occurs with a word that it modifies. But you can also say, your brother, I will So now, and I've produced a little sound, but that's not what's crucial. The, the gesture fully replaces a word. I call this a pro-speech gesture. Replaces a word in the same sense that a pronoun replaces a noun. And, and so now I will claim that there are certain properties of agreement verbs that we saw in sign language. Remember at the outset, I gave you this example from French sign language. I tell you, he tells him. Okay? So these are agreement verbs because they incorporate in their form the positions of some of their arguments subject position and object position in this case. Okay. Um, however, they too, just like the high features that we saw, just like normal pronouns, have a particular behavior under ellipsis. Remember that we saw that under ellipsis, in our original English example, a few slides ago, you could copy a verb phrase while disregarding certain grammatical elements. And we saw that the same thing happened with high feature specification. But you can also do this with positions in signing space. And so here is an example um, from uh, American Sign Language. Um, so here you have ratings. The ratings are on a seven point scale. Okay. And the important thing is um, that there will be an agreement verb, which will be, so that would be, I give you, behaves very much like tell in French sign language. But that would be, I give him, if this on the right was the position for a particular person, your John. Okay. Another crucial thing that I will want to show is that even though the position, even though the form for I give you money should be with a give sign towards you, somehow when the beginning of the sentence pertain to giving to John, under ellipsis, you can disregard this feature specification and get something which is acceptable. Okay, so that's the, what the next example shows. This is American Sign Language. So John, money I would give. You, not. John, he, money I give. You, I not give. Okay. John, money I give. You, I not give. Okay. And so what was going on here was the following. The target sentence, you don't need to look at all the transcription. The important thing is that you have a position which is position A, and give was a position from the, was a movement from the first person position to position A. Why? Because position A had been introduced to refer to John. But then when you say, you, I not, it means you I don't give, or you I don't give money to. And this is perfectly fine. This is a seven out of seven. But if you try to see what would happen if you copied the antecedent verb phrase, you would have something like, 
you I not give. And that would be totally weird because there's a mismatch between the endpoint of give and the fact that the object is here. And this is completely degraded, this is a three point five. And the end of the example was the good way to say this, which would be uh, you I not give with of course a different ending. So what do we see here? We see, in a way, another instance of things that we saw before. Namely, the fact that under ellipsis you can disregard certain grammatical uh, elements. Okay. Now, um, as it turns out, there is something in gestures which is reminiscent of these agreement verbs in sign language. There are gestures, they're not words. Okay. But if I tell you in a heated but metaphorical conversation, I'm going to, you get one meaning. You know, if I say you, I'm going to, you get a different meaning. Okay. You know, if I say John, I'm going to, you get a different meaning as well. So it seems that the distinction between first, second, and third exists in these gestural cases as well. Okay. And you can do this with a variety of things. So you can have the shoot example, you can have punch, uh, you know, punch related examples, you can have sent kisses too, there's a variety of them. Okay. But now here is the crucial observation. You could say something like, your brother, I'm gonna, and then you too. Now, I have your brother, I'm going to, and this is, you know, sideways. But if I say, you, I'm going to, that's a totally weird thing to do. It's a totally weird thing to say. So what we have here is another instantiation of the weird behavior of ellipsis. That there is a third person object verb, punch. If you try to apply this to a second person, that's completely off. But under ellipsis, it's fine. Okay. And so in fact, with uh, Emmanuel Chamlin, we performed an experiment on this, and we, we tested exactly this issue. So without going into details, this was the acceptability of the sentence in which there was a match. The mismatch, so something like, you know, you, I'm going <coughs> to, the acceptability was degraded. But when you went to the ellipsis case, acceptability was increasing. And so that emphasizes the point that there's more structure than you might have thought about these gestures which are not particularly common. So that's a conclusion that, in fact, there is more structure in gestures, and in particular, there's a second versus third person distinction with, in a way, gestural loci, so positions in gestural space that are reminiscent of positions in signing space. And they give rise to patterns which are reminiscent to the grammatical patterns that we saw uh, under, uh, under ellipsis. Okay. So at this point, you could think that all the arguments seem to suggest that with gestures, we should be able to replicate the rich, expressive possibilities of sign language. Okay? But I would think that this is not the case. But even when you take gestures into account, even when you notice that they're more sophisticated than you might have thought, this is not the case. So the two possibilities I want to distinguish are the following. So this is really following Golan Meadow and Brentari in a, in a paper that, in fact, I think just appeared. Their point was sign, and I would say sign with iconicity, should be compared to speech plus gesture, not to speech alone. So it could be that speech plus gesture has the same expressive resources as sign with iconicity, or it could be that there remain fundamental differences between them and I will argue for the second. But here, 
we need a distinction from semantics. It's the distinction between at issue entailments and presuppositions. At issue entailments are just the, the usual assertion. If it is just what you understand by the meaning of an expression if you haven't studied semantics. Presupposition is a condition that must be satisfied for an expression to be felicitous. And they interact completely differently with logical operators. So, um, this will uh, be clear in the examples that you have here in B. Okay, if you say, Mary, a student doesn't know that he's incompetent. Even though you're denying something negative, you still preserve the inference that Mary student is in okay. Similarly, if I tell you none of Mary students knows that he's incompetent, even though this is entirely under a negative quantifier, none, you get a universal positive inference about each of the students. So you get the inference that each of Mary students is incompetent. This is completely different from what would happen with a normal issue and film. So, none of my colleagues advises any student who's incompetent. Now you don't get anything negative about the student. But none of Mary's students know that he's incompetent. Yes, you do get something negative. In fact, universally so. Okay, so, so these are the enormous differences between an issue and film and position. Okay, so. The second belief we come to is that thematically gestures make it possible to match within spoken language the iconic effects found in sign language. Okay? And uh, I will claim that this is not so. Gestural enrichments do not yield the same effects as sign language iconic enrichments. There are systematic differences in their interaction with uh, logical operators. The crucial point is that iconic modulation of signs, which we see all over the place, can be at issue. By contrast, co-speech gestures cannot be at issue. They're presuppositional. So you think that you're comparing things that will give you the same result, but they don't. That will be um, the, the point. So I will start with iconic modulation, and I will make the claim that they can be at issue. Now, an iconic modulation is a modification of a word in iconic ways. Iconicity is the property of an expression that resembles the things it denotes. And there are iconic modulations in spoken language. They're just very restricted. So I'm not making a claim of the sort iconic modulations don't exist in spoken language. It's just they're super restricted. Here is the example. You say, the talk was long. Do you understand that it was very long? And it's iconic. It's because the vowel is very long that you get it. If you try, the talk was short. <laughs> it completely does not work. And, you know, if you, for instance, put this under a negation, if you say the talk was long, but it wasn't long, okay? now you're just denying that it was very long. So it really behaves like an issue and tell me. Right? It is denied by negation, unlike the presuppositions that we saw before, which were not denied by negation. Okay. Now, iconic modulations are very common in sign language. So these are various ways of, the, of uh, realizing in American sign language the sentence, my group group. But you will see that this can be realized in different ways, and I think you will get the meaning differences right away. My group grew. 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 Okay, and you have basically two parameters. There's also grammatical markers that play a role here, and, and, and you know, for simplicity, I'm not discussing them. 
There are two parameters that were uh, varied. How broad the endpoints of the verb grow were and how fast the sign was realized. And what you would imagine is what you would get. The broader the endpoint, the greater the final size of the group. The faster the realization of the sign, the quicker the, the group. Okay? So this is an iconic modulation. But of course, you have tons in sign language. And there's very few in spoken language. And you can check. Okay, so here, this is just a summary of the various meanings that you get when you take into account these two parameters in terms of speed, these three parameters in terms of breadth, and, and there could be all, all sorts of intermediate realization. Okay. You can also check that if you put these things under negation, in particular if you look at the version of the sign that means grow a lot, what will be denied is that the group grew up. This really behaves like the iconic modulation of law. So it is, in this case, an at issue until okay? So these are um, full citizens, if you will, of the um, meaning. Now, I want to contrast this to what happens with co-speech gestures. Okay. And so I'll, I will give you an example. An example. So suppose that there's uh, uh, little children playing, and I say, none of these 10 guys will help his daughter. So you understand that the helping is of a lifting kind. But the meaning is totally different from the one you, you, would, you would get if you said, none of these 10 guys will help his daughter like this. The difference is this. When you say none of these 10 guys will help his daughter, you understand that the relevant type of help is a lifting. In other words, for each of them, if they were to help, it would be by lifting. Now notice, you get this universal positive inference. The universal positive inference is something that we already saw. This was in the case of you know, none of Mary's students knows that he's incompetent. We got this universal positive inference, despite the fact that this was all under this completely negative operator now. Here we have exactly the same thing. It's just a conditional thing. For each of these 10 guys, if it were to help, lifting would be in pain. When you say, None of these 10 guys will help his daughter like this. You get exactly the opposite inference. That for each of them, if they help, they would not help like this. Why? Because when you say none of these 10 guys will help his daughter like this, now this is just a completely standard at issue and tell. It means the same thing as none of these 10 guys will help by way But the co-speech gesture has a completely different logic. And this is the logic of a presentation. So that's exactly what we saw before. Right? That's the universal inference that we got in this case and that we didn't get. So the typology, the conclusion is that in order to perform a real comparison between sign with iconicity and speech with gestures, we need to be clear about the contribution of different types of iconic enrichments to me. And what we just saw, that there is a type of iconic enrichment, the iconic modulation that you got in long, or that you got in uh, grow. Uh, this type of iconic modulation can be an issue. But there's another type of iconic enrichment which is what you have by way of co-speech gestures. Okay, that was punish, help. This is not an issue. And so the conclusion is that co-speech gestures will not give you, in the end, the same types of iconic enrichment that you have 
with iconic modulation. You have iconic modulations in spoken language, but they're super limited. They're things like long. You have tons of iconic modulation in sign language. So these are the claims that I made. Uh, uncontroversially, sign is part of the same linguistic system of speech. Sometimes it makes the logical form of sentences visible when it is covert in speech. However, sign has iconic resources that are mostly absent in speech. Okay, so it seems to be along certain dimensions richer. You might object that one needs to compare sign with iconicity to speech with gestures, not to speech alone. I started by completely going in that direction, by saying that gestures are more sophisticated than you, you might have thought. They even seem to have a tiny grammar. But then I said that despite this, there remain systematic differences between sign with iconicity and speech with gestures. Why? Because co-speech gestures, even though they enrich words, they're not at issue. And you could at this point go back to, you know, John's brother, I will. John's brother, I will not. And, and these, in fact, are at issue, but they're not words, right? They're not words, and they're very restricted because you need to understand right away what I had in mind. So even with gestures, speech does not match sign. So the final conclusion is sign language has visible, in some cases, logical forms and has iconicity. Uh, there are iconic mechanisms in spoken language as well. Co-speech gestures, co-speech gestures, and tiny cases of iconic modulations. Gestures have a grammar, but there remain systematic differences between speech plus gestures and sign with iconicity. So for this reason, sign has a unique role to play in semantics and in formal semantics in particular. This is really the situation of a morphosyntactician who was interested in case and studied just English and uh, French. If we're interested in the full range of the inferential technology and we restrict attention to spoken languages, we will be in the same situation uh, that a uh, sad morphosyntactician who thought he was coming up with a general theory of case, but only had the tiny remnants of case that you have found in English. So in order to get a full technology of inferences, sign languages have a crucial role to play in semantics. So more work is needed, but this is work which is very hard for me. And I would suggest that we need much more work on this topic by native signers and by deaf signers. I would argue that the field will radically change if we get much more fine-grained work on these topics by people who live in the language. Thank you very much. Single-minded question. Let me so the down. The point that you were making concerning ellipses is that certain things that are present in the uh, initial sentences like agreement, um, which in spoken languages could be gender agreement, and in sign language could be person agreement. They get lost once you do the ellipse. And the question is, how could it be otherwise? What would be the alternative to that? So, given that you're leaving some stuff out, what? Yeah, so, so the, alternative, the alternative to this is that you are forced 
to get the when you copy a verb phrase, you're forced to copy all the grammatical material that you get with it as well. Okay. And it's actually not clear that you don't get a slight trace of this. I mean, you know, the judgments in things like Mary likes herself and John does too, sometimes there's a slight hesitation. You know, sometimes people would say, you know, if you said, you know, Peter likes himself and John does too. There's no hesitation. This is totally fine. Mary likes herself and John does too. Maybe it's totally fine, but you know, my, my impression is that there's, there's, there's a slight hesitation. What you would expect if you were not allowed to disregard certain features on the ellipsis is that you shouldn't have a hesitation. This would be just completely off. Well. We should be uh, so. The prediction would be that essentially ellipses would be possible only when when there is total identity. Absolutely. Of every, yes. Uh, of every aspect. Uh, yes. yes. So I I want that would make ellipses extremely useless. <laughs> it would be very demanding, but you 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 would still totally be fine in you know John. You know, Peter likes himself and John does too. Again, if you take into account the slight hesitation that there is, I don't think that this is outlandish. I would tend to qualify things from the other end. It could be that we, what we're seeing is a phenomenon which is more liberal than what might think. That even non grammatical material can be disregarded under some conditions. And so there's a discussion in the, in the literature as to whether what gets targeted is just grammatical material. And one example I, I tested with slightly different results in American Sign Language and French Sign Language, and w which made me, in fact, be extremely cautious on the interpretation of the, of, of, of the judgment, was something which literally would be the nine German swimmers like people who support the nine of them. And, you know, in SL there was a way um, to have a pronoun with an incorporated normal. But nine is really not a grammatical element. So that's just the beginning. Um, oh, maybe. Pseudo ASL. This is using English words. Okay? Or for that matter, French Sign Language. And the next clause was the French swimmer does too. And the key question was whether we were going to be able to get rid of the numeral. And the judgment turned out to be very complicated. That's the reason I was so cautious. Because it could be that what's going on is that even though the numeral nine is not a grammatical element, it's in a certain sense redundant. And maybe you can get rid of redundant material across the board. So if you will, that would be a critique of what I said from the opposite angle. The the nine German, German swimmers, like people who support the nine of them, so who support the nine of them? The French swimmer does too. So if you can get rid of the numeral, this should get a reading. The French swimmer also likes people who support him. Okay. If you cannot get rid of the numeral, uh, the plural, this should be impossible. And you know, in, in the work I did on this in a 2014 paper, the judgments were very complicated. And in particular, in French Sign Language, it was just very, very liberal. So it seemed that you could um, somehow get rid of the numeral. I have to realize here, 
in uh, ESL, that would be an incorporated normal for the pronoun. Absolutely. So this, this, if you get these kinds of results, standard theories of ellipsis have to allow for the fact that you can ignore not just grammatical elements, but redundant elements in some sense. And so there's a, there's a debate on this, and there's a discussion in print on exactly these kinds of uh, examples, all these outlines, S-A-U. E R L A N D has a uh, relevant discussion. I have relevant discussion as well. I, I mean, th that's what's just to say it's a very complicated issue. One should not jump to, to conclusions. I mean, I'm giving you a you know, relatively simple picture, but um, there's a lot of uh, footwork needed. And it is important to avoid, to avoid the sort of dumb account of the fact that you're Absolutely, yeah. So I completely agree with this point that the fact that some elements are covert in one language and overt in another language is totally standard in linguistics. Um, and, and this was not the main focus at the start. In the case of pronouns, there is something special about sign language, which is that you seem to have an arbitrary number of positions in signing space that can uh, function as discourse reference. So people who see the sign language data for the first time often want to compare them, for instance, to obviative systems. To what sort? Obviative okay. systems, for instance, in Algonquian, where there are distinctions among third persons. But even languages that have obviative systems make a small number of distinctions. So there's Approximate, obviative, double obviative, I don't think it goes beyond this. What is striking in sign language is that really it seems to be um, limitations of performance that put an upper bound on the number of loci that you can use simultaneously. And so because of this, this particular instance of logical visibility is very special about sign language. We haven't seen, we haven't found any spoken language that has something similar in terms of making indices overt. But other aspects of, log of visibility in general, logical visibility, for that matter, you're totally right. We're going to find across languages a completely standard argument. By contrast, the target of this talk, which was <laughs> iconic enrichments, that's <coughs> very limited in spoken language for intrinsic reasons that the vocal medium will be restricted to a particular kind of iconicity. Uh, so length is fine. If you're interested in imitating sounds, right, certainly you're going to be in a good position the spoken language. But what, what's special about uh, sign language is that you get lots and lots of iconic modulations, which basically you couldn't get in spoken language not because of a grammatical distinction between the two. I saw that there are iconic modulations with long, but just because iconic modulations will be so empowered in spoken language. And this argument is specific about sign language. 
they will not be in a position to make this argument about other spoken language. Does that clarify? Yes, thank you. Um, so, what about this question? Um, based on your examples, uh, one thing is that the laws of the position can be sort of interpreted as index for pronouns. The case like A tells B that he will win the election. But on the other hand, in the case for ellipses, so the case that we really the tall, uh, a tall person he himself, and so the short person he is. But in this case, uh, the position is interpreted as a reflexive. But we know pronouns and reflexives are very different cultures in spoken languages, and they're subject to different kinds of constraints. So I wonder if that would predict a very mixed kind of behaviors with those kind of positions in some way. So, I'm sorry, next one. Huh? Is the that the next? So, so I, I looked at these example. I, I guess you, you had in mind this uh, French sign language example. He likes himself. He not. Okay. Uh, the reason I picked a reflexive was just to make a point that the same element, the reflexive, could be simultaneously super grammatical and super iconic. Let me take this opportunity to mention something I didn't mention. I, I, I very quickly hinted at it in the talk. Uh, the reason I had lots of videos cited was that if you modify the example to say that you know these two poor individuals training to be astronauts were in that position, the high position moved as well. And if the two poor individuals were in upside down position, what was the high position here became a low position. Okay? It was crucial to show that you have genuinely iconicity in action. That these things are simultaneously variables and simplified pictures of the denotation. I want to make one front point, in, particularly in, in French sign language, if you ask at least some consultants what this represents and what this represents. They will tell you, oh yes, the head is here. And in fact, th there's even a slight difference. In hanging position, they'll say, this is the head, okay, sometimes. And, and this is simply because, as an iconic representation, it makes sense to take this part to be the head. Okay? And so, as far as I know, the data are absolutely the same if you move away from reflexes. And in fact, the pseudo ASL or pseudo LSF example I mentioned here was of exactly that sort. So, because the dot 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 was like people who support them, right? You're not going to have a reflexive, okay? And you know, in um, these kinds of examples, so 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 this one involves bound or bound variable reading. Uh, but um, you know, as far as I can tell, if you look at high pointing, in this case, it will behave the same whether you have a reflexive or non-reflexive. Okay, so, so I haven't found, in other words, differences in terms of iconic behavior between reflexive and non-reflexive. If you expect some, that would be very interesting because, of course, there hasn't been tons of work on this, but I haven't found any. D does that answer your question? So I guess this is a bigger picture question about the iconicity that you were talking about in the second half, right? So a lot of these examples, even if you don't know any sign language, you can sort of understand, you can interpret the iconic component, right? So the second, third person, the gesture only examples, or like the rotations that you're giving. And so on the one hand, it seems like, do we, how much really is this part of the grammar, or are we accessing something sort of extra grammatical? Although it interfaces very tightly in sign languages, as you point out. Um, at the same time, I was very fresh from what I was mentioning Anne Marie Coquette's defense this morning, in which she was giving this example that I hadn't tied to her work, but I think it's interesting, um, where she talks about a very iconic um, use of temporal marking in Nicaraguan sign language, mm -hmm. where she says, so if two events happen where one is a subset of the other, mm -hmm. rotating on a ball, and in the middle somebody walks and stops and then keep rotating, 
this is something that we can all interpret. Mm -hmm. um, once you explain what's going on, you can see the iconicity and interpret it. But at the same time, apparently, it only develops in later cohorts in the graph and language. Mm -hmm. So the point, one of the points there is that it's a complex thing to develop, right? So yeah. people don't just gesture this. Home signers don't just gesture it. Like, people who only use a spoken language don't gesture that when prompted to describe the same kind of events. It's really a complex grammatical yep. phenomenon only available in a full sign language. So I don't. I was wondering your thoughts, I guess, on connecting the fact that on the one hand a lot of the meaning is transparent with the, the other fact, which is that it's very sort of complex. Um, there is a lot of complex grammaticalization that requires a full language. Yep. So and with the role of semantics, I guess, in that. Piece two, of two elements of answer. The first is that an iconic representation is a complex representation. There are different iconic conventions that might exist. So see this in, in painting, in fact. You know, there, there are different kinds of perspective that are used by different kinds of painting. And you need to understand, intuitively, but you need to understand nonetheless, what kinds of iconic conventions are being used. Uh, there's also a distinction between producing an iconic representation and uh, understanding an iconic representation. Uh, as as uh, Gennaro correctly guessed, I'm a terrible, terrible, terrible drawer. And I couldn't draw basically anything except maybe you know, the cross and the medallion. That's it. Um, but I have no problem understanding lots of iconic representations. So, so the fact that people are in a position to perceive these things doesn't mean that they would produce them spontaneously. And one last thing is that basically all of the sign language cases of iconicity we saw were embedded in signs. So you know you have the high low sign which were embedded in pointing. We had grow, which was embedded embedded in a particular purpose. And certainly there are things to learn about this as well. Now, I want to make one final point. Uh, there have been proposals whereby in high pointing, you have normal pointing plus a high gesture turns out to make very good predictions. And of course, what's the distinction between sign and gesture in sign language? That's not so obvious. In fact, there's currently ongoing work um, in um, Paris by Valentina Aristodemo. Asking whether there are very particular constructions in Italian sign language that maybe share some properties with host speech gestures. We don't know yet, okay, but that, that's a possibility. Okay, and so of course, it would make sense to say, you know, this thing is normal pointing plus a gesture. But now here's a problem for everybody, I think. It's that when you go to pure gestures, you get similar distinctions. So I mentioned this example of, you know, your brother, I'm going to and then you too. Meaning you too, I'm going to not you too, I'm going to But now what are you going to say about this particular locus, OK? And you could, in fact, replicate the high locus thing. You could say your giant brother, I'm going to and then you too. And you might not be a giant at all. Okay, so now you need to redo with gestures everything that we've done with signs. But what are you going to say about this high locus? Are you going to say that this is something grammatical and something gestural? Well, the entire thing is gestural. And I think one issue when discussing these examples is that gestures are much more sophisticated than one might have thought. They're much more sophisticated in terms of their semantics. They're much more sophisticated in terms of the grammar, if I'm right. And of course, this makes, this makes it all the more important to explain 
along what dimension. Even when gestures are fully taken into account, it turns out that sign language really has expressive possibilities that spoken language doesn't. But this requires this full technology of inferences that people you know, worked on for years and years in formal semantics and that people are only beginning to work on when it comes to uh, gesture semantics on the one hand and sign language semantics on the other. Does that answer your question? I guess the, the takeaway, but of many takeaways um, on this point is that, you know, despite the comprehension production asymmetry, still even, so like you need somehow full sign language to be able to produce, like uh, even if you're a really bad drawer or a really bad gesture, fluent signers can do these rather complicated things, right, that a gesture will never do. Yeah. Seems still a puzzle, even if gestures are very complex. Mm -hmm. I'm going well, just for a piece of information. So in sign language, you have uh, shifted in texticles. You can use for Yes, so... You know so what I mean, but yes. the others may not. Yeah. So, so, so let, let me introduce a little bit of the debate. So there are a variety of spoken languages that have been argued to have uh, verbs, things like say, think, um, which allow you to shift the context of evaluation of the decibels like I and you. Okay, so in such languages, John says that I'm a hero. I will write it down. not English, but the claim was that in, in a language like Amharic, something like John says that I am a hero can mean John says that he is a hero. So I is evaluated from John's perspective. Okay? There's all sorts of tests that converge on this conclusion. Here I'm not giving you an And so the question is whether we have this in sign language. So, the, the first answer is yes, in the sense that there is an operation called row shift whereby the signer shifts the position of his or her body to adopt a, an, a character's perspective. And then I, you, here, etc., can or must be interpreted with respect to that position. So there's been step away. Yes. Or shift his body. Yes, these are shifted interpretations of I you here. That's a monster. So exactly. So these are called technically monsters. These yeah. are uh, monsters are operators that Schlenker, shift Schlenker the, the context of evaluation of indexes. Okay, so I believe the first person that made this point was Joseph Pierre. Okay? And I've worked on this as well. Uh, many others have <coughs> heard of this as well. But the devil care, care, Joseph care. Q U E R. But the devil is in the details. Okay? And so other researchers, notably um, Catherine Davidson here, have argued that you should analyze these constructions differently. And one of the key issues is whether all these other tests that I mentioned without giving them apply. Okay. And this is a complicated question. Because if you see a language where you say you have John says that I'm a hero and I refers to John, one possibility is that that can work as a quotation marker. And of course, in English, if you say John says I'm a hero, there is no problem. That's the debate that there is. There are many more aspects to this debate. I, I think it's enormously interesting. Uh, there's a typology. Given the data we have at some point, but elicited with different methodologies, which is a, a, a bit of a worry, we don't have exactly the same generalizations 
in Catalan Sign Language, German Sign Language, French Sign Language, and American Sign Language. Okay? So it could be that there's a, of course, we all think and hope that we found some very interesting cross-linguistic differences. And in fact, they mirror cross-linguistic differences that exist in spoken languages. But we want to make, be sure that when we apply the same elicitation methodologies, we'll get the same. And then there's the theoretical debate, which is whether this is the, you know, the, the uh, context shifting analysis is the only game in town. Clearly, it's not the only game in town. And clearly, there's a very vibrant debate. Uh, so, so I think we'll know more in a few years. But, but that's exactly one of the areas in which having fine-grained semantic work. I mean, the, I think all the areas I mentioned are like this. But in this case, it's, 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 it's so striking that having native signers or deaf signers perform this kind of work would be a game changer. Uh, because we would get much better data on these are very hard data. I'm a little puzzled about that sentence. John says that I am a hero. Yes. If one says John says I am a hero, I could see ambiguity in that. But when you say John says that I am a hero, I don't. To me, that mm -hmm. does not. The, I does not seem to refer to the John. Yes. So so no. Thank thank you so much for for, for clarifying this. What I meant is that unlike English, where the sentence is unambiguous, in other languages. It has a different reading. So, so you are absolutely 100% right. If you say, John uh, says that I'm a hero, you cannot in English get the reading on which I refer to John. This is unambiguous. It means John says that I, Philippe, am a hero. But the interesting finding is that other languages are different from English in that respect. Does that clarify? Yes, it yeah. does. I, 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 was, uh, I apologize. I was going a little bit quickly because there were many, many things in, in the question, but you, you, you're, you're entirely correct. There's a question here. Um, yes, so I was only, so I think all your examples of cross speech gestures basically correspond to modifiers, mm -hmm. like adverbs or adjectives. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have other types of cross speech gestures that could be compared. Sign language may be expressive. Okay, so um, okay. Now, now this is this is uh, opening up another can of worms. <laughs> In terms, um, I, I, I think wonderful worms, worms that I deeply love. Uh, now. speech gestures, you, you could certainly get other things. So, so if you say, you know, if, if you had, you know, uh, something like um, the simplest case, you know, you, I'm gonna, you know, you, I'm gonna punish. Now, the fact that I'm pointing upwards means either that I'm talking about someone who is higher up in the room, or that I'm talking uh, to someone who is very tall, right? And, and of course, this is not exactly a modifier. You know, I mean, you can you can think of this as a modifier, except that this is a pronoun, so it has to be modifying something within the pronoun. But the strategy I used in order to get richer gestural examples, whose contribution to meaning is can be separated out from other things, was to use pro-speech gestures. So, for instance, in the example of, you know, your brother I'm going to pull, or your brother I'm not going to pull, where, where suddenly you see that this is an issue until then. It is within the scope of negation, so it is denied that I will slap your brother. Okay, and, and so here we can ask the question, uh, can we get, so you mentioned expressive, can we get expressive with these uh, pro-speech gestures, then we could go back to pro-speech gestures, etc. Now, um, it, it turns out, so this is very much work in, in progress, but, but in work in progress that has yet to be you know, fully checked with other speakers and with down the line with experimental means, I think that you can replicate the full typology of inferences 
that you have with pure gestures. Okay, so so I'll just give you an example. So so we we you know I, I displayed an example of a uh, presupposition-like thing, but it, it was a cold speech gesture. It was you know help or punish, and it was a bit complicated. So when I said you know none of these ten guys will help his daughter, we got the inference that for each of them. If he helps, so the thing will be involved. Okay. But you can get much simple things. So I can tell you, none of these helicopters is going to boom. And you understand something like none of them is going to take off. This doesn't mean exactly take off, right? Because I couldn't say none of these planes is going to boom, right? Because you need a different gesture for plane. Take off is fine to go. So it means take off in a particular fashion in a rotating back. But you still get the inference that none of these helicopters, that each of these helicopters is on the ground. So I said, none of these helicopters, are right? you understand, you know, none of them will take off, but you preserve the presupposition that each is on the ground. Okay. And, and I think this is a general thing. I think you can look at things like implicatures, um, so, so scale implicatures, uh, presuppositions, Expressives that you mentioned. Supplements. In fact, homogeneity inferences that Manuel Kretz has worked on recently. K K R I Z. Uh, all of these things, if I'm right, you can replicate with pure pro speech gestures. And if this is right, this is a new area of investigation for semantics. And what's particularly striking is that this example I gave you, it's also not a particularly common gesture. And you were able right away to understand not just the meaning, but the fact that there was a division between the addition component and the presuppositional component. So that's the whole. Um, with uh, this table that I am uh, showing you, uh, you are not in English, um, I'm curious about the, the, the line of distinction between pro-speech gestures and code switching with bimodal users. So if someone is fluent in both a sign and spoken language modality, yeah. and they switch over, so like this is a formal example, where if I said something like, uh, your brother, I will uh -huh. meet. Um, would that be considered post-speech gesture, because I didn't speak the word meet? Or would that be a switch, a code switch to signing? And then that would be iconic modulation that would be added yeah. to. Um, this is a terrific question. This is really a wonderful question. So uh, this is not a category I have discussed here. And I would not call these examples examples that involve pro-speech gestures, because what you're using is a mix between English and a sign language word. But they would be extremely interesting as a point of comparison to some of the sentences that have been, that have been using here. And in fact, one, it, it would be absolutely worth it to try to investigate, in particular in terms of grammar, how these um, code switching examples could work. So where can you code switch? Is there any relation between the positions as which you can code switch and the positions as which you can uh, use pro-speech gestures? I have absolutely no idea of the answer. But it's, it's, it's totally a different category. And I think it would be wonderful that this could be studied. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned the example of uh, uh, John told me that he will won uh, the election and said that uh, uh, we find that all the three in the sign language what we don't see in uh, uh, the uh, spoken language and uh, uh, disease can be seen as a uh, confirmation of uh, the indices that we postulate. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, in my intuition, it tells something uh, different, which is uh, that uh, maybe if we look more closely to uh, the real spoken version of those sentences, we realize that uh, maybe we do something and we are forced to do something that is very similar to uh, the uh, use, uh, pronoun with the, the uh, individual, which is uh, if we are in a real uh, uh, context of ambiguity, which is that 
both John and Bill are candidates for an election. There is no way to rescue that sentence without doing this action, which is John told B, to, uh, told B that he, John, or he, Bill, will won uh, the election. So, uh, my opinion, what it says that uh, uh, maybe we are a little bit, uh, uh, we tend to uh, look at the written version of uh, the sentences instead of the spoken, real spoken version, which has a uh, uh, means to uh, not leave unresolved ambiguities there, and we seem to be uh, necessary to make the utterance felicitous. Excuse me. So, 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 I think that there's two um, important points in what you made, I mean, in w w w what you just said. So, um, under, under what conditions could an ambiguity be acceptable? I mean, certainly there's going to be constraints in this on, on anybody's theory, right? If you utter something that's totally ambiguous and it matters for the purpose of the conversation or treating you have in mind, that should be weird. And so you have to do something else to save the sentence on pragmatic grounds. But now a further question is, what is this something else that you will do? So of course, you know, you can enrich the context, you could be more explicit, but one question raised by your remark is whether you could do something with pointing and with gestures. And you know, I, I have no, no idea how natural that is, but if you were to say, you know, you know, yes, I invited Sarkozy and Obama, and then you know what happened? Sarkozy told Obama that he would win. And, and now you're using pointing, co-speech pointing, in order to disambiguate. Okay, and I suppose that this is far less ambiguous than the original sentence. Now, this raises this other issue, but the same that we discussed before in connection with Isabel's question, which is to what extent can you replicate aspects of the grammar or meaning of sign language construction with co-speech gestures or with post-speech gestures? And I think we're just beginning to address it. Let me just add one cautionary note about these examples. So again, I, I gave you a relatively simplified version of the debate. But there is an alternative line on these positions in signing space, which is, you know, they are closely associated with discourse reference, but maybe there's something else. And, and there's such a line by Jeremy Kuhn, who claims that they should be seen as features features just like you know gender, which disambiguates as well, with the difference that there are tons and tons of uh, different varieties of this feature in sign language. So just so that you know that the debate is a complex one, as always. But you know, the view that uh, loci represents discourse reference is, I think, uh, very illuminating. To ask a quick follow-up yes. on this, which is uh, what prevents us from viewing this uh, pointing as simply a representation of what, in a valuable free approach, would be the path of composition that reaches onto the antecedent. So, uh, why exactly? Is it an argument for that? Yeah, so, so the, the argument that Kuhn gave was, was a different one. He wanted to go uh, with this variable free approach, but he really just wanted to say that this uh, constrains the kind of antecedents that you, you, you can have by way of features. But, but not, it was not supposed to tell you directly what the path of composition was, because you don't see anything as complex as the path of composition. You, you just see things that correspond to denotational properties of their interpretation. So this is not about Kuhn's interpretation. Yes, yes. This is not yes. about Kuhn's interpretation. It's directly your yes. interpretation. Yes. So again, and you know, what's wrong with this? Yes. What was the mm -hmm. idea that the indices point at a path, and therefore 
Well, well, I mean, so, so it's not that they point as a path, they point as a particular but position. But in so doing, they indicate and a path between the source. And that, I think, depends on the implementation that you want to give. But, but something really important has to be kept in mind. In simple cases, demonstrative cases, where there is no external antecedent, there is no discourse antecedent, I, you, and this guy, you just point towards these individuals. So you want a theory which, as a special case, gives you reference to um, a, um, an object which is present in the extra linguistic situation. And then for the rest, I would have to see the details of, of implementation. And again, when we're talking about three theories, so the theory I advocated, the theory that Kuhn advocated, and you were advocating yet another one. And so at this point, things become complicated and not fit. I would need to sit and see exactly how you would implement it. But the argument that you're now making that eventually you might want a theory that unifies an alpha and the X is kind of independent of the variable versus non variable. So this is independent, but you want to make sure that in this special case of you know positions that are real basically positions in the signing space that correspond to real positions in, and in which there's no antecedent follow from your analysis. So, so, so that's, you know, that's an issue for everybody. If you see loci as denoting things, you get this right away. But again, you know, people in other traditions can uh, say certain things in order to get this case as well. There are cases in English where you are required to use gestures, I think, and I don't know how this would fit into this. Like, can you give them guidance? I need two volunteers, you and you. Mm -hmm. And I can't say I need two volunteers, you and you, without the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So, I think this is this this is um, uh, correct. Um, now, something a little bit broader um, might work. I mean, you, you know, you could you you could perform the gesture with your head, for instance, with a head nod, and that might work as well. Of course, this is a case in which, uh, without a gesture, you might get this impossible ambiguity that you don't know how to resolve. Uh, for purposes of the analysis I presented here, that, that's entirely fine. I mean, the, the point I wanted to make is that absolutely we need to reintegrate gestures into spoken language for purposes of comparison between spoken language and sign language, you're, you're saying for purely grammatical reasons, we need to reintegrate some gestures into the study of spoken language. That's entirely fine. I would agree as well. And then, the, you know, the rest of the argument was even when we perform, even, at, even when we reintegrate uh, gestures into uh, uh, spoken language semantics, we'll still get systematic differences between sp spoken language and but, but I would be completely open to the kind of conclusion that, that you are arguing for, and that uh, actually other researchers have argued for, including for, for French, I believe, um, that um, um, I, I, I'm not certain of the, the last fact, but uh, that, that we need to, even for grammatical purposes, reintegrate gestures into the studies of the moment. Well, I thought you were saying that, like in a sentence, there's rather ambiguities, like Sarkozy's sentence. You can say the sentence without the gesture. Mm -hmm. You can't say the sentence I said without a gesture. It's completely weird. No, so so you, you're right that this might be a different case from the third person example. I mean, the third person example is totally fine without gestures yeah. in most cases. And maybe this one is different. We we'll need to investigate um, it a little yeah, bit. Just because the fact that the gestures can save it is not so surprising. No, right? just that it's it completely impossible to right. get out. Uh, but so, so 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 it's it could absolutely be a different kind of case of you know how necessary the gestures are. I was just saying it does not affect the broader point. Good, good. I, yeah. I wanted to make. It. 